All right, everyone, I think we can go ahead and get started. Hello again, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Salah Farooqi, I'm the lead R&D scientist at PetroLearn, and I welcome you to the session number 14 of the past talk series, where we are going to listen to a very interesting presentation by Felix Herman. I, I would like to thank all the speaker who accepted to give a talk in this series. Our June schedule is full, and we recently posted the June schedule on our LinkedIn account. We are now working on the schedule for the month of July. If in case you are interested to give a talk, please contact me or email us at info at betterlearn.com. Uh, our next seminar is uh, on June 2nd, a very different talk by Susan Nash from AAPG. Uh, titled Crash or Scales to Rebuild, Recon Reconfigure Our Pandemic Rape World Opportunities for Geoscientists. Let me add more, add more people, okay. Uh, we are still experiencing a very difficult time because of the COVID-19 and the reopening that has not yet helped the operation in oil and gas to regain the steam. Therefore, we plan the future talks to be more centered around uh, enhanced geothermal energy and subsurface CO2 storage and monitoring, which seems to be more attractive these days. We hope these talks open doors to new opportunities for oil and gas people as well. Before introducing Flix, I would like to ask everyone to mute the microphone and turn off cameras. If you have any question, please raise your hand during the talk when Flix actually called us or at the end of the, the session. Uh, and we will answer questions as many as possible. If for any technical and non-technical reason you cannot stay with us until the end of the session, we are recording all the talks and we are posting them on our website so you can go ahead and watch them there. Um, so I'm now I'm going to introduce our speaker today. Flix received his PhD in 997 in engineering physics from Delft University of Technology. After research a research position at Stanford and MIT, he joined the University of British Columbia in 2002 as a faculty. He joined Georgia Tech in 2017, where he is cross appointed at the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, Computational Science and Engineering, and Electrical and Computer, uh, computer in, uh, Engineering. His research program spans several areas of computational exploration seismology, including low cost and low environmental impact acquisition with compressive sensing and processing. He has among, uh, he, he was among the first actually to recognize the importance of uh, compressive sensing and large scale optimization others in problems involving simultaneously acquired blended time-lapse data with subsurface related multiples. Flix is the uh, this year's co-recipient of the SCG Regional Fessenden Award from ConocoPhillips for his contribution to the field of compressive sensing. His title for the talk today is, Sometimes it pays to be cheap, compressive time by seismic data acquisition. With that, I would like to turn it to Felix to start the presentation. Well, thank you, Al. Thank you very much. Uh, just one small correction. We, we received uh, uh, the prize with Conical Phillips, with Chuck Moser from our Conical Phillips. Anyway, uh, thanks uh, okay. very much for the invitation. Um, it's um, basically a sort of an inverted talk. I gave this as a uh, SEG distinguished lecturer traveling around the world. And I think now that people are joining from all around the world while I'm doing this from home. So how can uh, times change? Um, so um, in case you didn't guess, I'm Dutch. So uh, we like to be cheap. Uh, but I think that's a topic very pertinent to these uh, times. And um, I'll talk about how you can use techniques from compressive sensing to drastically reduce cost of seismic data acquisition. Okay, so let me first give you a little bit of background. Um, so all this work is done in, in my group. It's called the Seismic Laboratory for Imaging and Modeling. And we have really been, uh, it's a supportive industry responsible for driving several innovations. And we do that by leveraging basically uh, recent developments in mathematics as well as in computer science. Uh, but then we can only really make progress if we also understand really what industrial problems are. And I think uh, we do um, because we are able to talk across these different disciplines. 
Um, I think it's fair to say that we are leaders in uh, the development of new seismic data acquisition technology with compressive sensing. Uh, but we also work extensively on what I call wave equation based inversion techniques, such as uh, full wave inversion or reverse time migration, which are sophisticated techniques that invert the acquired data and turn it into uh, useful images. Uh, and we also work a lot on the computational front um, and, and uh, working on efforts to, uh, to move things to the cloud. Um, and, and all as sort of in part of, of, of making technology uh, more readily available so companies don't have to buy a big crane machine uh, to conduct some of these uh, important seismic data inversion steps. Um, specifically, uh, some of the innovations we have been responsible for is early on, uh, like in the uh, early 2000s, uh, we were really a, a, the group that sort of uh, proposed the use of the curve of domain to do seismic data processing uh, for noise removal, multiple elimination, sparse inversions, and things like surface rated multiple elimination. Um, but then we moved on a little bit after that to concentrate on techniques that borrow ideas from compressive sensing to really fundamentally rethink how you do seismic data acquisition. And that will really be the main topic of today's talk, but I still would like to use this opportunity to cast a little bit broader a perspective on what we're working on. The great thing about that is that that technology has given rise to tangible improvements in productivity that range between five to 10 times. And uh, in addition, uh, we're making the case that we can do time-lapse acquisition or monitoring without having to replicate the survey. And we'll talk extensively about that during this talk. We also worked on uh, randomized sampling techniques to speed up computations of reverse time migration, full wave inversion, which already have given rise to significant reductions in computational uh, time and therefore cost. And um, we are also, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, in the process to move these things to the cloud. And by uh, making codes that are serverless, we also able to reduce uh, idle time of compute nodes, which make it, uh, the cloud now a viable alternative to having your own very large data centers. Okay, so what's the motivation for today's talk? Um, the real drivers here are that a lot of techniques in seismic data processing, but also techniques such as reverse time regression and removal of multiples and full wave inversion, they like to have dense sampling, wide azimuth, and long offset. And then if you're interested in time lapse, you also want to have repeatable surveys. And that's a challenging uh, from the economics perspective, it's expensive, uh, but also there are challenges in the field that have to do with the environmental impact, for instance, of, of your acquisition. And so the solutions I will be discussing today have to do with rethinking fundamentally how we sample for land and marine and, and using the insights from compressive sensing. And in the end, what it boils down to is that if we subsample, that is we sample lower than what Nikos would prescribe us to do, uh, you will have typically artifacts and uh, we will basically uh, render these artifacts into noise, and I'll tell you in a minute how we do that, and then exploit structure that resides in seismic data to, to basically get rid of these artifacts, and with that we get basically high fidelity data at very uh, dense samples. For the time lapse, we do something in addition to this, and that is uh, we use the fact that the different surveys serve, basically share information, right? Uh, over time, you, Earth doesn't become Mars, so um, there is information shared, and we use that. Okay, so how should we really think about compressive sensing? Really, it's a technique to increase acquisition productivity. Okay, so the main uh, research questions I will be talking about today is, do we really need to sample periodically at Nyquist, as we all learned in our uh, undergraduate courses? Um, I will then proceed by talking a little bit about um, whether we need to actually replicate surveys uh, in the field to get good time lapse repeatability. And that's a controversial statement, uh, but I will make uh, a case for it. 
And then if time permits, I can talk a little bit about how all these things tie to recent developments in data science and machine learning. Okay, so um, I have a talk that has way too much, um, but I will select some topics of, um, of what's going, uh, what I have listed here in the outline. I think I will talk about an introduction on, on compressive sensing and talk about what this impact has been in on industry. And then I'm pretty sure I may have to jump uh, to basically how we extend these ideas to time life marine. And I will draw a little bit is how we adapted this technology to marine, but uh, I will do less details of that unless I get very strong feedback. And, and I will pause for some feedback uh, a little bit later on. And then if time permits, I will talk how we can extend these uh, ideas to flu SMF, uh, long offset marine uh, acquisition. Okay, so what's the key idea of compressive sensing? It really relies on three key concepts. It relies on the fact that seismic data somehow permits a sparse representation. And that's uh, basically the same as saying that whenever you have an image uh, on your computer, it's basically compressed with, say, some compression algorithm. And that leverages the fact that a lot of natural images, including seismic, permit a sparse representation. And now we're going to use that sparsity in tandem with the fact that if we change our sampling by randomized sampling, we can actually go way under what Nikes would prescribe us. And then we would basically use a sparse recovery algorithm to get the data back. That specifically leverages the fact that seismic data uh, has permits some sparse representation. Okay, so throughout our basically a lot of references, a lot of these links are active, although they may uh, point to my old website at UBC, but uh, that is Ivan Mirror at Georgia Tech right now. Okay, so what is compressive sensing then really, right? It's a cost-effective sampling paradigm where we, as I mentioned, we construct sparse signals from incoherent, that is, random subsamplings. And the challenge then is, how do you design seismic data acquisition systems that can do this random subsampling? And subsampling means you sample less than you would normally have, therefore you reduce costs, or if you're willing to spend the same amount, which I doubt these days, you could uh, sample much finer. And mathematically, this involves having to deal with a non-determined system of equations and some fancy optimization techniques. And uh, I will, well, I'll not have a lot of math in this talk, but everything I can assure you is based on rigorous math. And so the whole idea is that we can get rid of uh, some of these very restrictive sampling criteria, criteria imposed by, by Nyquist. Okay, so traditionally, what you would do is you would, uh, and think about, for instance, what, you, what your camera would do, is your camera would uh, sample with a very uh, nice transducer in there at Nyquist, and then it will compress because you fully stored and and then from the compression you you recover on the fly when you look at your photographs or you look at something on the screen in cs we do something different we actually use the fact that the signal compresses by sensing less and 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 then exploit that same sparsity that was a basically allowed you to do the uh compression uh to basically uh, get the full signal back now this is a technique that was born in uh, in mathematics by a program supported by NSF at the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics back in the uh, early 2000s. And um, it was really a, 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 a new insight in mathematics that resulted so far at least into 10,000 papers. Uh, but a lot of them are very theoretical and there are few practical breakthroughs. Uh, the one I discussed today is one of them. Um, and there's another one which uh, I will mention in a minute. And uh, we were at that program, uh, you can see in the picture on the right. Okay, so it took 10 years to basically take that technology and turn it into speed ups for MRI imaging by eight to 16 times. And the challenge here was that you want to de-risk. You don't want to have physicians making wrong diagnosis because you cut corners. And so, but people have been able to do that 
uh, with the support of NIH. And this has basically resulted in new technology that now is being rolled out by companies like General Electric and so on that will significantly reduce the turnaround time in an MRI machine. And David Donahoe uh, testified at Congress about this. Okay, so what is this compressor sensing? Well, it, as I mentioned, it has a take home message of my talk today, it's sort of this slide, right? Seismic data. And that is, I think, reasonable because seismic data is not like white noise, right? So uh, if you find that structure, it means you can compress it somehow. And transform domain sparsity is one way to do that. And you can use different transforms to do that. And then you need to rethink a little bit how you do your sampling. And so, and that is designed to break that structure. And in a way, it means that you turn coherent aliases into incoherent noise. And the way you can do that is by randomizing your position. So for instance, put your geophones at random locations or fire your uh, air guns at random times or fire your, uh, your, your fiber size system with random sweeps and so on. And then we use uh, mathematical techniques to recover the full data uh, by using uh, fancy optimization techniques that promote that uh, structure. And for instance, you can do that by one norm minimization. Okay, so let's see what that looks like for a very uh, relatively simple example, but that tells the whole story, right? So suppose we have a, a signal that is sparse in the Fourier domain. So it is a superposition of three different Fourier modes. So at the bottom, you see the the wave number, and at the top you see the signal in time or could be in space. And when you sample densely, then if you Fourier transform, you see these three different spikes that correspond to the three different Fourier modes in the signal. Okay. And so, but now we live in times where our management will tell us, well, we can sample this densely because that would say be the number of shots or the number of receivers. So we have to sample uh, more frugally. And so uh, what you would do then perhaps is to sample periodically. And now we all know that if you do that, you're on the risk to create aliases. And that's what happens here. And it's very difficult to discriminate these aliases from the true signal. And that's why people try not to aliase, right? Or they would low pass filter the data, but then you lose resolution. You don't want that. Okay. So what happens if you sample randomly? So you take the same number of, say, geophones, so the cost is the same, and um, you now look at what its Fourier spectrum looks like. Now, rather than creating these coherent aliases as with periodic sampling, you now create basically noise. Sometimes people call this spectral leakage. And noise is much easier to separate from spikes than separating spikes from spikes. Well, that's basically the story, right? So now this is a nice sort of example uh, academically. So, um, okay, there's thunders going on here. So uh, don't worry about it. We have thunderstorms here in Atlanta. Okay, so um, let's see what, how we can use the fact that this random sampling renders these aliases into noise. So um, for that, you need a little bit of mathematics. So what we're dealing with here really is a solution of an underdetermined system of equations. And that is because the observation vector B is shorter than say the full spectrum. And that's because we sampled on the night burst. So we're dealing with a flat matrix A that we have to invert somehow. But we can choose how we take these samples. And that is exactly the difference between say sampling periodically or sampling randomly. And so we can basically look at the math. This matrix is really given by the inverse of the Fourier transform because we were sparse in the Fourier domain. And this R is a sampling operator that either takes samples periodically or takes them randomly. Okay. And so we can now use something, namely sparsity. And because the spectrum had only a few non-zeros, we can basically use the 
the fact that that vector x0 is sparse, and therefore the only few columns of this matrix that are important. And now the mathematicians tell us, oh, well, wait a minute, now we can do much more by inverting the system if we somehow mathematically express that we, we know that what we're looking for is somehow sparse. Okay, and that's exactly what we do here, and that's the last math slide for now, is we solve a sparse recovery problem where we basically ask the question, can we find a Fourier spectrum, but find it such that the one norm of it is, is minimized, that's the sum of its, uh, of its absolute values of each Fourier mode, Subject to that if I apply the inverse Fourier transform followed by sampling, I explain the data. And this is in case there's no noise in the data, and if there's noise, <coughs> excuse me, then you would solve this within some noise level. Okay, and mathematically we know how to do this. And that is sort of uh, undergirds everything, or a lot, that I will be talking about during this talk. Okay, so now, of course, we need to think a little bit, how do we represent seismic data? I mean, everybody I think here has heard of the Fourier transform, uh, but there are other types of transforms. So let's just ask the following question. If I take a Fourier transform and I only keep 1% of the largest coefficients and I take an inverse Fourier transform, what happens, right? And you can see that if you do that, that you lose basically a, uh, the important body waves, those reflections, these very weak events here in the shot record. Um, and that's because you subsample too much. And so then you could say, well, why don't we use waywards? Because they are used in JPEG, right? And um, they don't do much better. Uh, but if you use curvets, and we only use 1% of the curvet transform, and this curvet transform is a decomposition of the data into little plane waves that have different scales different orientations and are very good in representing seismic data as a very sparse superposition of these sort of waveforms, right? Then we get a much better recovery, right? So here you can see that you lose a little bit, but you still keep the coherent reflection events that we would typically be interested in. So, okay, so what? So what can we do with this? So let's run by a very specific example and uh, let's look at a shot record on the left. So a shot record, uh, for those of you who are a bit rusty on seismic, uh, vertically we have the time axis and horizontally we have, say, the receiver position. And this is a data set that we simulated in the computer. So all these events are different reflection events, but we subsampled by a factor of three. And what happens now, if we look at the wave number frequency domain, that we see these coherent aliases. We see basically copies of the same spectrum, and that's bad news. So if we now do this sort of sparse recovery, we end up with coherent noise. And you can sort of see that here in the reconstruction, is you can see a lot of artifacts and things where the dip is not really clear. Okay, so now instead of using periodic samples, we can use the same number of uniformly random samples. And what we see now is that the spectrum is turned into a noisy spectrum. And we basically only have to sort of denoise the spectrum, but it's not really noise, it's incoherent aliases. And now the reconstruction is much better, right? We go up by 3 dB, and uh, uh, while it's better, you can see some amplitude streaks. And that's important uh, to deal with because if you're interested in, for instance, AVO, and they are associated with where we have large gaps. So what you can do instead is something that's called jitter sampling, where uh, you control the size of the gaps, but you still are random enough to render your uh, sampling into, into noise. And now we gain another uh, more than basically, well, not more, but close to one dB, right? So by being clever about sampling, you can recover from uh, subsamples, right? And so, um, that's basically uh, what sort of started this field and, and that has been going on since the uh, early uh, 2000s um, all the way up to uh, more or less today. And so um, I, if I put this slide on because there is some fights and, and there's some court cases on patents and stuff. And uh, this shows you what at least the academic record is with this technology. Okay. So, um, 
I will very briefly pause here if, if there are any very important questions before I will talk a little bit about what the impact of this technology has been on industry. If you have a question, raise your hand. Okay, so we have one from Alan. Okay, go ahead. Alan, All right, can you... Alan go ahead. Um, can you unmute me? Yeah, you're unmuted. You're unmuted, okay, yes. Hey, this is really fascinating. Um, what assumptions do you make about noise to begin with? Um, you, you showed a few spikes and you showed amplitude, so that looks like it's a perfect signal to noise. What assumptions do you make about noise? How random that noise is uh, on land? Um, are you able to consider surface waves, near surface waves, and stuff like that? All of the above. And actually, you want to do this for a coherent noise, such as surface waves, which are typically very high spatial frequency. And uh, we can deal with all of those above, and people have been dealing with that. And I will actually touch upon some of that during uh, my little review of what industry has done with this technology. Okay, so uh, let me proceed. I will once in a while uh, take a little break to, and I appreciate the questions, and please do so. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, this has had some impact on the industry, and uh, there was a special issue of the leading edge that's devoted to this compressor sensing. And I will basically go over some slides that are basically made by ConocoPhillips. And uh, I rely on this because frankly, in academia, we never have access to uh, real data sets from, indust from industry that matter. And that's, you know, that's just uh, the commercial aspects of the business, right? So, but this technology came completely to being uh, through initial work we have done, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, so the whole idea that was instigated by my group is to, instead of fighting uh, randomness uh, by sampling everywhere periodic, you deliberately sample coarsely but randomized. Whether this is how you do things on land or feathering of cables, there are lots of opportunities uh, that you can explore to bring randomness in your acquisition that you would normally try to fight. Uh, um, and, and so that's maybe one of the uh, main controversial, perhaps, uh, messages of this talk. Okay, so what this randomized subsampling has resulted in is an enormous improvement in basically uh, acquisition efficiency. Um, ConocoPhillips quotes five to 10 times. And so that means that you can acquire way more data per day. And um, this also means that you can massively reduce costs. Okay. And so there are a, a few examples on real data where they uh, employ the technology. So, um, and again, to, to remind you, what is the key idea here is if you, uh, think about conventional sampling theory, and here there's a synthetic, basically, uh, example where there are some plane waves traveling with different angles, that if you sample this two cores, then uh, you will end up with a, a, a spectrum. If you sample it randomly, you end up with a noisy spectrum, but then you can use these techniques uh, that I will be describing to go to an unaliased, basically un noise-free uh, data, but having sample things at a much uh, finer sampling rate. Okay, so uh, where was this employed? Well, one example includes wind operations in the North Sea, where the window of operation is typically uh, limited by uh, stormy weather. And so all the red bars here uh, show that how often the system was on standby. And so that means that if you really want to stand a chance to collect data, you have to be as productive as you can during the time windows uh, at which you actually can acquire data. And by using these compressor sensing techniques, they were able to do that. And so what they end up uh, gathering is data that has these noisy 
uh, artifacts. And these knowledge artifacts are exactly the ones that I talked about when you randomize your acquisition. Um, they are easy to basically separate from signal. And you basically map that noise, which are really interferences, back to signal. And that's what you see on the right. And so what you're able to do now in this setting that involved basically ocean bottom nodes, but uh, shooting with an air gun uh, at the top in the marine environment, but doing that non-uniformly um, with simultaneous source shooting, you were able to get very high fidelity data. And that actually uh, gave rise to significantly improved images, right? So in the left, there is a, uh, an image that was obtained by using a legacy streamer survey. Then in the middle, a very expensive ocean bottom node survey. And then on the right, a survey that was acquired with this compressor sensing technology, which ConocoPhillips refers to as CSI. And so what we were able to do is to randomize basically the source positions uh, and, and basically have with a uniformity that ranges between 50 and 35 meters. With that, we were able to basically recover data effectively at a, uh, at a much finer sampling rate. And that explains the, uh, the improvement in the image. Uh, similarly, for a dynamic marine streamer, uh, you can do this by randomizing the distance in the cross-line direction between these different streamers and randomizing the shot interval, right? And uh, as long as you know where you are, and in this case, uh, they just allowed the streamer to do whatever it did, and so it wasn't trying to necessarily keep that streamer perfectly aligned, it allows all of the randomness to enter and with that, again, they were able to improve their final image significantly and reduce costs, right? And uh, there's an example here of the legacy post uh, time migration they applied on the legacy data versus the data that they uh, acquired with this compressive sensing technique. And I don't think you need to be a seismic specialist to see the, in, the significant improvement between these two which is also reflected in this coherence plot at the bottom. And then as a final example, uh, land. So that in part, I think, addresses some of the concerns Alan raised. Um, they did the same thing where they got a massive improvement in the acquisition uh, by getting way more sweeps in, sweeps in per time unit. So the light gray here is the traditional method and the dark blue is the cumulative amount of shots they got over time by using uh, this compressive sensing technique. Right? And so, and that uh, resulted in uh, a very significant improvement of the, uh, um, of the end product in the migration, where you can see that the legacy data is quite noisy. It doesn't reveal these blocky structures that people care about. Whereas when you use this compressive sensing technique, you get a significantly improved image. And again, a time slice of this coherence shows a much more acceptably geological structure than all these artifacts that you see from legacy code. Okay, so um, this is, I think, what you can consider a, a bit of a success story. Um, I think the research that was done at the Simbet Consortium that I was running at that time has really been responsible for this and is, a, I think, a fantastic example of how public-private partnerships can basically bring real value. Um, I think what we were able to do in my group is to establish uh, that randomized marine acquisition can be seen as an instance of compressive sensing and with that opening all the insights and rigorous mathematics of that approach. And we helped in that way de-risk the technology. And then a company like ConocoPhillips took this up and actually really did it in the field. And they report up to 10 times improvements in acquisition efficiency, and both on land and marine. And in the citation letter that is about to be made public, uh, to, that comes with uh, the fact that we both jointly won the uh, Facenden Award, they quoting that they saved $345 million in, in indirect direct costs using this technology 
over the, since they established this. And I think uh, that completely justifies why academic groups can actually really make a difference. So uh, then the, the question of course is what's next? And how can we extend this to uh, time lapse, uh, to full estimate 3D as an uh, acquisition? And so I have these, all these topics uh, prepared. And um, given uh, the interest of time, I do suggest that we, uh, that we may uh, go to, uh, the, to how to extend these ideas to time lapse. But before I do that, I may take uh, one or two questions before I move on to that topic. I will make the slides available, so if you want to understand more details how we really adapted this technology to marine seismic, uh, um, that can be found there. So maybe it's one or two questions before I move on. Please, if you have a question, raise your, raise your hand so I can unmute you so you can ask. So I have one question myself. So um, you showed the periodic and random sampling methods and also showed that the random sampling works a lot better. This tells yeah. us that uh, we can train a machine learning model that can do much better between these two approach. It can be periodic or random. Yeah, have, you so ever, have, have you ever looked at this? Yes, and I have a few slides in the end about that. Yeah, of course we have. Yeah. Great. So another question, is there any limitation for soft surface structure complexity? And uh, no, except that it would affect maybe the constants a little bit. So uh, if, if, if you have a highly complex data, then you will be, uh, you will compress less, but there are inherent redundancy in the data that I'll exploit, particularly in the full SMS. And if I can get to it, I can talk about it. Thank you. So we have one more question saying, are there implication on AO, AVO and AVAZ analysis? I really don't know what they stand for, but. Uh, no, that, that stands for uh, amplitude versus offset or amplitude, amplitude versus angle. No, okay. actually the AVO results were, uh, if you have to believe, Conical Phillips, spectacular. I think particular for the North Sea data set. Perfect, thank you. We're, we're good, so we can continue. Okay, so let's uh, draw a little bit on how we can extend these ideas to uh, marine uh, time-lapse seismic, okay? And so the key idea here is this. Now we all hopefully agree that randomized acquisition is a good idea. How does that translate to when we want to do time lapse or monitoring? And so um, I will talk about that. Okay, and that will give rise to some surprises. Now, this is all done with computer simulations. This has not yet been done by industry. Um, I hope people will do it because it will save them massive amount of cost when they're interested in time lapse. Okay, so. I will look at, at the case where we have a single baseline survey and a monitor survey. And in this case, I generate synthetic data where we introduce a, a, a little fluid substitution and therefore the data associated with these two data sets have a, have a sort of a localized difference. For now, I will assume that that's the case, uh, but everything I say can be extended to more complicated cases that were discussed a few lectures ago uh, on this lecture series. Okay, so we have then uh, some data, right? This is baseline data, monitor data, and then the difference ideally, and mind you, this difference is very small. I had to multiply the amplitude by a factor of 10. Okay, so um, what are we gonna do? And so I'm gonna use the fact that seismic data is sparse, and this is sort of the sorted coefficients of, in the curve of the domain of the two surveys and the difference. So they're super sparse. That is only few coefficients have large uh, amplitudes and then a lot of other ones have small amplitudes. So by the way, this also helps really good for denoising. And they also very correlated between two different surveys. This is a cross plot. So, and that is sort of reflection of the fact that the difference is even sparser. So how can we use that? Okay, and that's sort of the second uh, take home message, right? And that is, we're going to use the fact that different vintages share common information. As I mentioned, the Earth doesn't uh, move to Venus overnight when you do two different uh, uh, vintages, right? And so what we're going to do is come up with an idea where we make as unknowns both the common components as well as differences with respect to the common components. And then we use sparse recovery to recover that. And we use the fact that this common component is observed by two surveys. And so that gives 
unfortunately, one more math slide. Uh, I hope it's not too hard. Uh, it's a bit of linear algebra, but the idea here is that you introduce an additional variable z0, which really describes what is in common between the two surveys. And then you can go to the baseline and monitor, which is indicated by the index one or two, by these other vectors, z1 and z2, that are the differences with respect to the common component. And so you have now this two by three system, and wherever you see things in red, they both talk to the common component. And now, of course, you can ask the following question. Should we choose these two surveys that are randomized the same, or should we choose these two surveys differently? And so, um, well, and this is a topic of some controversy because the time-lapse people in the field will tell you they spend all their dollars to try to make A1 equals A2. What I'm saying is that in real life, you don't stand a chance to really do that because there will always be some known or unknown errors in the placement of your sources in the sequence. Okay, so what does that do if we look at the realistic marine acquisition? And so here we are going to use a compressive sensing scenario where we compress the conventional marine acquisition with air guns. So the stars indicate the firing times, the vertical axis is time, the horizontal axis is source location along a seismic line. And normally what you would do is you would fire with long intervals so that the shots don't overlap. What does compressive sensing tell you? Ah, you know what? You can fire at random times more frequently and uh, compress the recording time, therefore compress the cost because the crew spends less time on C. And then in the computer, we can reconstruct something that's way denser, right? And that's the miracle of compressive sensing. But now, of course, in time lapse, we have to uh, think a little bit, what is the key we give to the captain? Because this is a key where we tell the captain to randomize his shot locations or firing times, that both, of course, related through the speed of the boat. And so, um, well, that's exactly what we do here. We have in the middle, a acquisition where we jitter in time and therefore in space between a flip-flop between basically uh, basically two air guns that flip-flop and we have a random pattern here in the middle and a random pattern on the right and we can play games. We can either say the random patterns are the same or they're completely different or they have some overlap. And we can then ask questions, how does that affect the recovery of the different vintages and perhaps also of their difference? Okay, so here we see what happens if we do disjoint recovery. And now something, and that disjoint recovery, I mean a recovery where we use that model where we invert for the common component as well as for the innovations. And what happens is that if we do not overlap, we do better. And we can understand that because the A1 and A2 both see the common component. And if A1 is not equal to A2, then you get more information, therefore you have much better joint recovery of the shot records. The difference is a little bit more subtle, um, but there the effect is even more drastic. If you do independent processing, then you really need overlap, because if you don't overlap, you're toast. If you do that with independent processing, if you do it with joint processing, you can still see you do way better, but you degrade a little bit if you do not overlap. On, basically, your overlap is, you don't replicate 100% of your shots, but only 25% of your shots, so you lose. But is this really true? Right? And that's a question we can ask, because this assumes that what you did in the field exactly lands on a grid, and that everything is perfect, and as I mentioned earlier, real life is not like that. So what happens if we are slightly off? So we have known deviations of your source locations. And these deviations can be as small as one meter. Right? So you told the captain to hit this shot point, but unfortunately he or she uh, hit another shot point, slightly different. Well, then all the advantages of a 100% overlap are actually out of the window. And you actually benefit from having some sort of randomness, some sort of deviation in the recovery of the vintages themselves. And the advantage that you have in the, uh, in the, the difference is all is out of the window. 
So you spent enormous amount of money trying to replicate, but you can never replicate within the error bounds that you need in order to really benefit from this replication. Okay, so the question you can ask is, should we really replicate? I mean, is it maybe better to just go out in the field and have the captain tell you where he or she was and take it from there? And that's exactly the approach that Comical Phillips took for their individual surveys, not for their time lapse yet. So we really embraced the randomness. But there's one complication is, you know, trust but verify. And that is um, maybe what the captain tells you, what the post plot acquisition was, is not equal to what the true field acquisition was. And so we may have errors in where we were. And you can uh, call those calibration errors. And, and they are can be an enemy of compressor sensing. And so uh, for that, we uh, did a whole bunch of experiments. So we, we got some statistics where we basically uh, compared the conventional DEN survey with flip-flop irregular shot sampling. Uh, but then we basically did the traditional regularization versus a low cost compressed survey where we uh, acquired basically four times cheaper uh, the same information, but having to do then also do shot separation, interpolation, and regularization. The regularization is needed to bring things to a regular grid. Okay, and so let's look at what happens now if there's an error. And the horizontal axis here is the calibration error. That is basically the error in the shot location of where the true shot location was versus where uh, we thought it was in percentage. So if the shot spacing was 25 meters, 10% means the two and a half percent a two and a half meter error. And I compare the conventional in green and the compressed joint recovery model in yellow. And, in, and I also look at independent, but for now we'll ignore that. I'm sorry if there's a lot of background noise, but Atlanta is also known for very hard rain and there's a lot of rain at the moment. Okay, so what happens? If you look at the SNR of the recovery of the vintages, if you really are able to fully calibrate, you do better. And, uh, but as soon as you are a little bit off, then all those advantages are out of the window very quickly in regards to the SNR of the recovery of the vintages. If you look at the repeatability, which is expressed in an NRMS value, and contrary to the SNR NRS should be small, then the results are even more drastic. That means if we look at parts of the signal where there was no time lapse, where we should not see any imprint of the differences in your acquisition because nothing happened, you can see that the joint recovery model does already better even if there's no calibration errors and remains very stable for large errors much better than the others. If you do the same for the SNR of the time lapse itself, you can see that the yellow, except for when there's no calibration error, is very good or even better than doing things conventionally. And the same is true when you look at the uh, NRMS values for the region of the signal where there was time lapse. You can see that the yellow is, is always very small except when you make no calibration. Okay, so um, that I think uh, answers two of the main questions. Uh, one, and I think that one is already uh, answered by industry, you can come up with very low cost acquisitions by not doing periodic sampling. Um, and we can do that because the Earth exhibits structure that we can exploit and so, um, the follow-up question is, uh, can we use this uh, in combination with uh, uh, sparse recovery to recover time-lapse data? And then do we really need to replicate? And the simulations I showed show uh, evidence that you may not have to do that. But uh, that has not yet been proven in practice in the field, and I'm looking for partners to do that. Okay, so I don't know how I'm on time. I guess I have a few minutes. 
to talk maybe a little bit about how to extend this to, to, uh, to Marine. Uh, I think what I will do is I will just finish that part and then take questions if that's okay. Perfect. Okay, so I talked so far mostly about seismic lines. So acquiring seismic data along a line, although the examples of uh, conical Phillips were of course uh, 3D. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how we can use these techniques for full SMS marine seismic. And so now we go to a problem that is two orders of magnitude larger because the seismic data volume is now made out of two source, two receiver coordinates and time. So it's five dimensional. Uh, first is seismic lines, which is three dimensional, one source, one receiver and time. So this is a very large scale problem. And so what can we do there? And so there's a whole bunch of papers on this again. So um, let's look at the case of sparse random OBN. And the real, to remind us, what we are trying to do here is to interpolate very sparse samplings using mathematical techniques. And this is just one 3D shot record, and we have thousands of these. And so how can we do that? And so uh, and while maintaining basically repeatability and all the nice things that I've talked about. And so one of the techniques that we have used is instead of using sparsity promotion to go from subsample data to interpolate data, say, we use um, matrix factorizations. And this is really related to uh, the Netflix problem, where the matrix of Netflix consists of users and movies they like, and then they have basically only a limited number of entries of that matrix, and they try to recover that matrix. We use the same techniques. And we use the fact that you can represent the data in a low rank factored form for each frequency. So this is one frequency slice where a four dimensional matrix is unfolded along the source and receiver coordinates. But we unfold it in a clever way. We unfold, unfold it with the source and receiver coordinates for X and the source and receiver coordinates for Y. And that permits a very low rank factorization which also leads to massive compression of the data. And so with that, we can basically recover data. So here you see all these little round thingies. That's really one shot record. So this gray guy is one of these. So this is a massively large data set, substantially subsampled, which with the low rank techniques we can reconstruct. And, um, and again, this is all driven by the mathematics. And so we apply this to a very cool acquisition scheme proposed by, by uh, Slumberger, and that's random core acquisition, where the data that we have uh, access, access to, and this is just the source X and source Y, but the same thing is true for the receivers, is we have only data at the blue dots. And so how can we interpolate this data? And so um, this is sort of where you have the receivers and sources both together, so you can see little half moons, and each of these are little parts of a, uh, a multiple streamer array that they pull in, in these sort of randomized corals, uh, which is a randomized acquisition. And so again, this is the full data at uh, seven hertz. So this is one frequency slice, and then we zoom in, and this is like one common source data as a function of receiver Y and receiver X. If we impose the mask on this, this is what we acquire in the field. And you can see the data that we have collected here on the right. And after our interpolation, this is what we get. Okay, so, and this is the error. Okay, so what it tells you is that we can use these techniques to really uh, sort of uh, deal with the curse of dimensionality that hurts us in acquisition costs, but also in the uh, manipulation cost of these massive, sometimes up to petabyte data sets uh, by using this factored form that enormously compresses. And we can do that by using matrix or tensor factorizations. And they really exploit redundancies that live in the data that go beyond the complexity of the subsurface. Irrespectively of the complexity of the subsurface, you have those redundancies, but you can only exploit those by processing with all the data rather than in small windows. And, um, and this is only sort of 
uh, scratching at the surface because these matrix factorizations are really just a single layer autoencoder. So you can do things with neural nets. And so that's what we did. There was a question on that, but I see I'm way out of time. So I'm gonna uh, basically just show you that we can do this so we can train a generative neural network to interplay data. And uh, not unexpected, this will work uh, much better, right? So at much higher frequencies uh, with uh, much higher fidelity, and we, we presented this at the SUG. Okay, so what are the lessons learned? I think it's fair to say that compressive sensing technology is viable in the field. It's been done, systems have been calibrated, things work out, companies are reporting massive cost savings. That $350 billion doesn't, million dollars, sorry, not billion, I wish. Uh, is something that is a real tangible number and companies like Conical Phillips are willing to go on the record for that. I do think that full SMS processing, rather than using brute force techniques where Conical Phillips used massive clusters, we can do this cleverly with matrix factorizations on a few nodes in the cloud. And what this also really shows is that mathematics and public-private partnerships really work give tangible results that really, really matter for the bottom line. Um, and that's it. There are some resources you can find here online, and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your presentation, Flix. It was very interesting. Sorry, I have to turn on the sound. The, 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 the rain is very, very loud. I'm sorry, I'm on the roof. <laughs> I wish we had more time to discuss more on the machine learning part. It should be very interesting. I hope we can have another session with you to discuss that part. So if we, if you have any more question from the, let's see if we have one, any. So it seems we don't have any question from participants. Uh, so I think we're good. We can call it the day. And thank you so much, Felix, again, for accepting to give a talk here. And everyone, please follow us on LinkedIn to receive updates about the future past talks. And with that, let's go and enjoy our Friday. Bye all. Okay, we got one. Okay. We got one more, one question, Flix, if you're still there. Sure. This from uh, Raga says, uh, are there any studies involving multi-component data sets, um, multi-component data. Yeah, I think so. And there's, ex there's additional structure you can exploit there, right? So um, uh, I don't see why every, anything I talked about won't work for that. And, and, and as I said, there's additional structure because there are relationships between the, uh, the, the different components that can be exploited. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us today. Bye.